so, um, thank you, um, Rajni and Sandeep in New Delhi, and Jim and Robin in Georgia, and me in California. I love this. Um, let's start with your childhoods. When you, Jim and Robin, you were not raised with any kind of Hindu connection. What, what, what did your parents, your family tell you about why we're on the planet and what happens after we die and what is God or not God? What did you learn, each of you? Go ahead, Rob. You want me to go first? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, but, well, first of all, both of us, <clears throat> Um, come, come, come out of obviously uh, different family backgrounds, but the similarity is, is that both of our families um, immigrated to the U.S. Um, because of persecution in um, uh, Eastern Europe in thereabouts. Um, we come from a Jewish background, and um, so... Also, uh, when we were born in the early 50s, it was after World War II and the Holocaust and all. And so our families and my family, I'll just speak about my family, my family um, going back three generations <clears throat> were, were very observant in um, the different countries of origin. Hungary, uh, Ukraine, what is now Ukraine, Austria, uh, Austria, Hungary, which is now Ukraine. Um, and they wanted to assimilate very badly. I mean, it was not a good thing in the world to be Jewish. So my parents were very assimilated. And, and so what I learned from them was nothing religious. It it was very sec. It was very um, nature oriented. You know, there's the world, and there are powers in the world, and everything is is natural and nature oriented. And um, that the idea of God, I do think my mother did communicate that God was was everywhere and in everything. Uh, which, if you go back to Jewish mysticism, is is there? You know that the the shards of God, the light of God, um, is in everybody, everyone, and everything. So that was consistent. But there was no um, religious kind of ritualistic approach. And then um, I was always very spiritual as a child, and and very interested in all the different religions of the world. So I studied and I also, I read books. And now I'm talking about when I was young, like 11, 10, 11, 12, eight, nine, maybe even. And, and, um, <clears throat> but we were also very influenced by the Beatles and the sixties and the, the, um, introduction of Eastern philosophies and in Eastern religions in the sixties and um, India and all. So that became, and I was 11 in the, you know, when, when the Beatles first came to the States. So that was during my high school years. And then in, uh, when I was 18, I started having spiritual experiences from, you know, myself. So um, that's pretty much what my background is. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> my family also originally came from England and also uh, Lithuania. I just I actually just found out two days ago uh, that history was corrected by one of my sons did the ancestry. And for all these years, we thought we were from Ukraine and uh, Russia. And he finds out actually it was Lithuania, which is, you know, on interesting on my dad's side. English on the uh, mother's side, and uh, they were Jewish, and uh, my memory of growing up with religion was that my parents would go to Friday night services, and most of the time left me with my friend's house uh, and Sunday school, where we would hear all kinds of stories. Um, 
of which I didn't really, um, you know, it wasn't that interesting to me. Um, but it was mostly a secular, a secular life, you know. I mean, uh, we'd go to the high holy holy days uh, services, and really, I just didn't have that much interest into it. Nobody, uh, we didn't have any private, you know, one on one moments. Uh, my parents never really did that. Um, so my my rearing my childhood in uh, where when we lived in the plains in Kansas was was not really it was very secular you know very americanized secular uh what we call reform judaism and i called it fake judaism because <laughs> you know <clears throat> uh to give you an idea of i mean they were very simulated uh to give you an idea what it was like uh years later uh, my parents met one of my spiritual guides, um, and I didn't know where this was going to go. And it, it was about an hour and a half conversation. And the whole time, I mean, I had a 10 year, 10 year relationship with this person uh, named Kitty Davy. And um, my whole relationship was, you know, based on spirituality uh, and God. So I had no idea where this, this, conversation was going to go i was very nervous and they spent the whole time talking about sailing shopping uh <laughs> sunning more shopping more golfing uh driving here and there totally mundane absolutely mundane um and that was what our life was like when i grew up in my younger years um pretty much into my middle teens until I started having uh, spiritual, quote unquote, spiritual experiences, um, which uh, drew me toward a different path. So. Okay, we'll find out about that in a minute. So, Rajni and Sandeep, you you were born with Hinduism. So, um, say a word about that. And in in the West, we think of religious practices. You go to church or temple once a week but in india the like puja is done more on special holidays and maybe daily in your home it's kind of a different organization tell us about your childhood experiences mm -hmm. okay, so uh, <laughs> uh i mean i'll say that uh, you know it's not an organization at all i mean that is you know uh, what shall i say the beauty of it uh, because every home kind of practices it in a different manner and not just home it's it's a very very individual thing so you know people do it as it suits them so as a child uh, while I was growing up in my home you know uh, uh, in ev I think in every Hindu home you would find a corner you know where the gods are uh, you know placed uh, uh, the idols are placed and uh, you are supposed to kind of worship them at least once a day so my mom was a teacher, my father was a government servant and we all, you know, so mornings were busy. So we used to, you know, do the daily ritual puja in the evening, right? So we would light the lamp and, uh, you know, we have this uh, standardized, uh, what is an arti called? It's called an arti, you know, it's a kind of poem that you sing in front of the gods. So that was the daily ritual. I mean, uh, the most common one, if you have heard, is called Om Jai Jagdi Share which is, you know, addressed to the God, God Almighty. So that was, you know, the daily thing. And apart from that, you know, we have uh, the religious festivals. And uh, so those were all about, you know, celebrating and getting dressed up and, you know, uh, making dishes and, you know, having, uh, eating, you know, the festive uh, food and all that. So, but again, you know, that was also part of, uh, what shall I say, the annual calendar. So we would have Diwali and Janmashtami. And so there are lots and lots of festivals where one kind of, you know, uh, sits and prays. But uh, I was a reader. So, I mean, even as a young child, I would read all the, you know, scriptures that I could lay my hands on. <clears throat> so, so as a child... Uh, like I said that, you know, one kind of finds one's individual God also because, 
I mean, uh, Hinduism has so many uh, options for you to choose. So as a youngster, uh, you know, I could probably connect with Krishna, you know, as a rebellious teenager or something of that sort. So, so as a youngster, I mean, Krishna... Uh, then I got married. I came to you know Sandeep's house. In their house, uh, you know, although his mother was no more, but uh, you know that uh, little temple was there, and there I found you know Shiva was the one installed because Shiva has a family, right? He has Parvati and he has Ganesha, and also as a family uh, woman, then I started kind of worshiping Shiva. So uh, just just follow Shiva uh, when she's saying Shiva is got a family but Shiva has two sides in fact one Shiva is a hermit without family in fact and there's sits on Kailash there's a mountain called Kailash and there's another part where he he uh, come down from mountain that and to 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 uh, to take a household with the Parvati and that is called Kashi so there's a story of Shiva travel from Kailash to uh, Kashi so uh, there are a lot of stories. Actually, our religion is based on stories only. Uh, from in my child childhood, uh, uh, obviously, as you must be knowing, there are two epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. Uh, these two epics uh, were obviously retold again and again in terms of short short stories. Uh, let's uh, let's say between, we discussed between the families also. So whenever, because see, in our daily life also, whenever you talk to someone. Uh, people uh, at that those times especially gives you example from those epics on Kundi. Yeah, you learn a lot of things uh, in terms of uh, values, <clears throat> obviously rituals about the time. Well, those are timeless. I I say uh, I must say those are timeless uh, values yeah, examples. Uh, the Bible. Getting from it. The Bible is like that too. It's parables and stories that <clears throat> deliver a message. Do you, do you think it's fair to say that like in the Bhagavad Gita, that the message is that we each have a dharma, a path that we are uh, born into and that that we are, our duty is to do our best in to follow our, our karmic dharma. Is that a fair statement or not? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I mean, uh, that is what I uh, want to stress on that more than the ritual part, it is the value that, you know, one imbibes that, uh, you know, we were, uh, we are still a vegetarian family. So we believe that, you know, uh, God resides in every living being. So not to hurt uh, uh, anything. So as children, I have a young boy and, you know, so children, you know, they, they enjoy hurting the insects, especially I've seen that, you know, it's part of their curiosity that, you know, they would pick up the ants and, you know, the butterflies and all that. So, so you would tell them that how, you know, it's wrong to, you know, hurt these insects also because they are also, you know, part of our living uh, uh, kingdom and God is there in them also. So, uh, I mean, as a young boy, I, I had seen... Uh, him rebelling against it also you know at times he would say Dek lunga God go. i mean I'll, I'll see when i grow up you know what god is going to do to me <laughs> because if i have to see this insect you know tear it apart then i'll probably do it but you know i mean when you say these things again and again that kind of uh, you know those values are imbibed so you know respecting the elders uh, so i feel very happy when you know some neighbor tells me uh, that, you know, some elderly person when they were lost or, you know, so my son would be the one who would go and, you know, drop them home and, uh, you know, take care of things like that. So, so that is, I think, a very, very important aspect of, uh, of our religion. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. I like to see that when um, Indian people touch the feet of the elders in respect, it's, it's really a very kind and meaningful gesture of respect. And the elders go, oh no no no, and it's 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 really a, a sweet <laughs> a sweet ritual. Um, okay, Robin and Jim, let's go back to you. How did you discover Rajneesh and Hinduism? <laughs> well, let let me very 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 clearly <laughs> um, 
say that we do not follow Rajneesh, that we follow Meher Baba. Oh, excuse me. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And Rajneesh is a very different uh, pathway path yeah. than Meher Baba. But um, um, to make it to make it short, because we have done interviews with you on this before, and in your book as well. <laughs> Um, that as as teenagers and young adults, so I was 18, I think Jim was, he'll, you know, tell you as well. Um, and I started having spiritual experiences. And then when I was a freshman in college, I, um, just before, the summer before, I, I had a very traumatic experience and it made me search a lot, even though I didn't realize I was searching. And I was reading a lot of different uh, spiritual books. Um, and uh, my English professor in college, um, I thought actually from what he was saying that he was um, a, a Buddhist, but he, he was an American Jewish guy who... Um, was following an Eastern path and I could tell that. And then he um, told me what he was doing and I started to read uh, and also go to meetings. And then I started having my own spiritual experiences um, and uh, understood what Meher Bob explains is that every seven to 700 to, uh, to 1400 years that there is a, a god state called the avatar and um it started in in western religion it, it's the parable or the story of adam the first human male and that this is a a state of god that there are many states of god and so when one of your questions that you sent out was um, our Hindu gods and goddesses and, and symbolic ar archetypes, <clears throat> are they actually deities or are they something else? And so this relates to that because what, what I believe and understand is that there are different states of God <clears throat> and then there are qualities <clears throat> of God. And I think that the different states of God um, for example, Paramatma is God in the beyond, beyond state. It's the kind of the formless uh, God energy that is in everyone and everything. And then the soul, the individual souls are just like drops of that ocean. So they're called Atma. And that's that's the 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 state that we experience in the uh, realm of time and space and illusion and duality. And then there are different positions and states of God. So a sad, sad guru, who is a perfect master, is also a soul that has reached enlightenment or godhood, but is not the role of the avatar is the one is the 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 state of God where God incarnates into a human form, just like um Sandeep was talking about Shiva, who has who is both uh a, Atman Kailash and also has a family and is in the physical world. And to me, that um, is kind of the same story. It's the it's the state of God that's that's on the mountain, which is, you know, kind of universal uh, state of God. And then the human uh, when God comes into a human form, it, it then they live, it lives in the world, the realm of time and space. So, um, so Jesus is an example of an avatar as well. Exactly. So, and uh, Buddha, and yes, Muhammad. Ram, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Meher Baba, and um. And then that's that's only this cycle of time because <laughs> Mahapralaya is when God breathes, you know, in and out of the universe, and so there there are different yugas or ages. 
So uh, everyone June says June. we're in a really negative, difficult yuga. Kali yuga. Kali yuga. yuga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When is it going to be over? Soon. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> what, Soon. <laughs> Roshni, what do what do they say? <laughs> what do you what do you know about that? <laughs> Difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know if I answered the question though exactly, but I, I that's tried. That's a good start. Yeah. Repeat yeah. the question. Oh, it's okay. Wait, the, the, let's. The, that was a good question that Robin asked. What What's your understanding of where we are in spiritual time in terms of the Kali Yuga and are what what's what's going on with this Yuga? See, I mean, I am not a very, uh, what shall I say, the space and time person in terms of uh, that, you know, I don't worry about, you know, the past or bother about the future. So, you know, because like you talked about Gita, I mean, one one can only be responsible for what one mm. is doing. And, you know, uh, I mean, so that is the only thing that is in our control. So the things that are beyond my control, uh, and uh, why, why, why should I bother about it? So just be good. I mean, from what I have learned is that, you know, I try not to hurt anyone in my, you know, through action or word or even in my heart. I mean, I try to stay away from jealousy or, you know, bad no, things. And I try to focus on, you know, what good, what more good I can do. In, so I, I guess uh, that, that is all uh, that I care about. I mean, when the world is going to end, you know, it will someday. <laughs> it will someday, but uh, what of it? So everything uh, comes to an end. Um, are, there, are there particular uh, gurus or in, enlightened teachers that influence either of you? Uh, I mean, again, you know, no offense. We are, to we are not really religious in that way. You know? We yeah. don't follow particular God, or oh, sorry, particular uh, Guru, in fact. So, uh, but yes, uh, as I'm telling you, we also already read a lot of uh, stories from the, these two epics, again, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So, uh, I think uh, those books, including Gita, Gita also, mm -hmm. uh, contains each and every aspect of life. So, uh, mm -hmm. For understanding that uh, there's already a lot of things already said and done. So we try to follow the, all the goods mentioned those those scriptures. And, you know, uh, like uh, Rajneesh wa, uh, uh, was a very, very, you know, learned man, I would say that. And uh, But <clears throat> being, being from India, honestly, I would say that there are a lot of con men also, you know, moving in the world, pretending to be, you know, gods or gods incarnate. So uh, I am personally very skeptical of, uh, you know, I don't know anything about Bhair Baba, I mean, first thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every other year, I mean, we get, uh, you know, people who were godmen for uh, about five years, ten years, and then, you know, they are in jail for, you know, money laundering and, mm -hmm. you know, raping women and, you know, running these kinds of things. So, personally, I'm there very... There are people in the world. Yeah, so... Yes. No, we will be free. We'll find you, you, you know you know of you know of Sai Baba and um Upasni Maharaj. Yes. So Meher Baba was no, no, no. Uh, Sai, not the original Sai Baba. The original yes from Sai, the nineteen twenty. Yes, Sai Baba South from the South India, yeah. Okay. Here okay. Okay. Here okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. And and Upasni Maharaj who was a Brahmin, he was from the Hindu. They were they they were uh, two of his masters, of Meher Baba's masters. And when he was in the ashram with um, uh, Upasni Maharaj for the last nine years of, Upa you know, for nine years of Upasni, Upasni told his followers that now Merwan has my key. So this is, this happened in the 20s, in 1920 something. So I, I totally agree with you that there are a lot of, um, self-proclaimed gurus in India, and one must be very, very careful. Very careful. Uh, yes, very yes. careful. 
And so, in the U.S., and it, it, with the sad thing is how many of them end up being sexually aggressive and exposed for, you know, taking advantage of their chelas. So it, exactly, that's a sad thing. Well, that's why I wanted to clarify it's <clears throat> not Rajneesh, because Rajneesh became Osho, and that was uh, not a, it's not a good <laughs> environment as, yeah. as far as... Right, a lot of sex, uh, I, but 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 not so uh, with us. And I think that one thing that Meher Baba um, <clears throat> explained very carefully is, you know, beads on a string. All the religions of the world's coming together as beads on a string. And really, a lot of the people he never he never asked people to give up their religions or anything. So it's mm-hmm. just a um, an understanding of the cosmology and the, the spiritual, um, uh, the, 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 the true enlightened souls, which, you know, Shiva and Ram, Krishna, Shiva, you know, all are. And one, one time when I was uh, in India on an airplane, I sat next to a man who had this beautiful emerald ring and I commented on it and he said, oh, um, Sai Baba manifested it for him at a at a gathering. That's so, I mean, not the same Sai Baba. That's such a Sai Baba. That's one of the ones they're talking about. Uh, the, Sai, the Sai Baba that we talk about is uh, Sai Baba of Shirdi. That was in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Yes, yes. Um, so there are two different uh, Sai Babas also. Yeah. Yes. Well, this was a gorgeous ring. Well, Jim, why don't why don't you say a bit more about how you came to Meyer Bob? Um, well, what came to mind when you asked that question um, was uh, I look at as um, I was a recipient of the Great Weaver. Uh, in other words, that Almighty, whoever you, however you want to call him. When I look back at the series of dreams and occurrences and quote unquote synchronicities that happened over the years and the early, particularly the early years, um, it's a giant job of weaving the story. So it was absolutely, uh, you know, the conviction is there because of the way the story was weaved together where you just couldn't argue with it. I mean, you couldn't intellectualize uh, after looking at all the experiences. So uh, with that in mind, that's the background that I look at it. Um, But it started with a dream that I had when I was seven years old, um, being on top of a hill, uh, which I didn't know where it was or anything. But in the dream I could see angels surrounding me and I knew it was you know a very holy ground and then I woke up and promptly decided at that point that I was never going to tell anybody about this because they think I was nuts um and forgot about it and fast forward um 14 years when I was 21 um this is not well other things that happened before that that continued the process starting when i was around 14 or 15 i had an, another uh, quote unquote experience a direct experience uh, of a being in my room um uh, which was so bright and so powerful that you know i knew intuitively that if they came any closer i could not with i could not hold that energy in they came inside my body and I woke up literally um, above the bed, you know, like it was electric shock. And then I spent the next couple of hours having what you would call remembrances uh, of being at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was. Um, and actually, Rob and I have, mm-hmm. there's some side stories here. Past life <laughs> memories. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But that came into the picture, and that was very pivotal because of the timing of when that happened. Um, fast forward a little further, uh, the for, we had moved from the state of Kansas down to Miami, Florida. The very first person that I met as a friend when I was 13, when we moved, 
turned out to be my contact with uh, with Meher Baba a number of years later. Uh, so you can start seeing the weaving of all this. Um, anyway, about 21 years old, when I, I, I ended up going to India the first time and to Maribad and Marizad and Abad Nagar, where the Samadhi is for Baba and his, at the time, his mandali or his close circle, a lot of them were still alive. So we got to meet them and talk to them and really share. But one of those trips, uh, I went out to Marizad, which was Baba's home. And there's a there's a mountain behind uh, the residence called Seclusion Hill. And, and that was the hill that you had dreamed about. Yes. Well, that's what happened. Uh, that's the punchline. Um, <laughs> I, go up the base. I had no idea what was going to, you know, I was just like, oh, let me go up at lunch and see. What is the name of the place? Sorry. What's the name of that place? Uh, well, it's near. It's all near Ahmednagar, which is in the Maharashtra Strait, state, about 120 kilometers northeast of Pune. Yeah, well, um, the the um, Marizad is uh, so, Pimplagan. Yeah, is the so Mar town. Marizad is about uh, 12 kilometers, uh, one way from Nagar, and Marabad is like seven nine kilometers the other way. They're all very close. Morgan. Yeah. So Who I knows, went, you know, it might be our story also that, you know, we should go there. <laughs> well, yes, we're, we're coming. <laughs> we have our tickets. I did want to say, oh, really? share oh, this. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, Let me, all right. Lovely. When, when, you, when you get there. We, we, we yeah. bought our tickets and we're we're uh, flying to um, now after pa the pandemic. November 6th, we're leaving from Atlanta and arriving in Mumbai on the 8th of November, and we'll be in India for three months. So you're absolutely welcome to come and visit us and stay with us uh, for, you know, and, and just see the area. Come for tea. We take you to Nagar. We take you to Maribad, Marizad. <laughs> absolutely. I think we'll, we'll, we'll definitely plan it, you know. Or then, uh, you can stay yeah, with yeah, us yeah. if you want. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, um, that's, Jim, that's, what, that's lovely. What, what, set Meyer Baba apart from other gurus and teachings for you? Um, well, you know, it was, um, I had actually been introduced to um, another one named Sharan Singh, who was Kirpal Singh's brother, uh, and actually got some prasad from him indirectly uh, as a gift. I, you know, I didn't ask for it. And um had an experience from the Prasad and I had no idea what Prasad was. I had no expectations. It was totally out of the blue. And um, I ended up writing Sharon Singh a letter and saying, what do you think of this Meher Baba guy? You know? And uh, he wrote me back very soon after and said, well, that's basically what he said was well, that's for you to discover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, you know, what had happened was uh, my friend Benji, who I had mentioned uh, was my contact, um, a week after I graduated from high school, I ended up moving into the commune that he was living in. It was an old five bedroom house with eight or nine people there. Most of them were Bible lovers. They're all, you know, in their early 20s uh, or late teens. And uh, I ended up sharing a room with Benji but what happened was when I went to visit him, when I, I experienced a feeling of love of the, you know, divinity in that house that, that uh, it was, you know, I came home to a family that I never had. I never had that feeling in my own family. And I ended up sharing, you know, a bedroom there. And uh, I had some experiences while living there that pretty much sealed the deal. Uh, for me, um, getting into it a little bit, what happened was when I first moved there, I started reading a couple of books um, uh, about Baba and then what he had written. Um, and actually what had happened is a couple of years before, I had, I had started reading a book by uh, Anayat Khan, uh, Murshid Anayat Khan, a Sufi, Sufism, and had experience from reading the book. I was hearing all kinds of bells and things and just went into bliss reading this book, which was kind of unusual. 
But anyway, I was reading these books about Baba the first couple of weeks I was staying there. And I was having these incredible enlightenment feelings just from reading the books. Uh, they were absolutely just, you know, coming out of the pages and making me, you know, really blissful. But at the same time, um, I just thought it was bonkers that this guy said he was God. You know, I had read in the literature saying that he was the avatar of the Christ. And so I'm reading this stuff and, and absolutely getting, you know, you know, when you know, when you know, there's a like an intuitive feeling. It was very strong. But at the same time, I was having this t internal tussle saying this guy's, a, a you know, basically a bloody idiot. He's, he's crazy thinking he's God. And after a couple of weeks of this, um, one evening before putting the book down, it just kind of occurred to me, you know, it's like, well, you know, if this guy is really who he says he is, then the search is over, you know. And then, of course, the next thought was, search what search you know what are you talking about <laughs> um because i had no context for this you know hold on so that night um we had a painting between our beds this huge six by six foot painting of baba and i woke up at four in the morning with this painting standing by itself at the foot of my bed <laughs> 10 feet away from where it had been hanging up on the wall coming down on the way coming down you know falling on me and his face in the painting hit me right square in the face and it was you know it was a rather jolting experience and i picked the painting up and put it aside and went outside and spent the next couple hours weeping uh over down by the bay because it was basically you know you you wanted an answer you know so that was one among a number of incidences that had happened that really nailed it. And so that by the time I was in India, this is five, four years after that all happened, I'm sitting on top of that hill um, and the remembrance of the dream from being seven years old, really it was like somebody ripped a curtain open and that it wasn't like going, oh, I remember that. No, it was like a lightning bolt hit me of that remembrance. It was that was the spot where that dream was, and that really that was a that was a clincher because it was like showing me that even before I had any concept of what God was or that there was anything like that, uh, I was I was already taken care of. It was already a done deal, you know. Um, Karma. Yeah, yeah. As as we'd say in Boston, karma. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you, you, so, you 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 mentioned your past life together. Could you tell <laughs> us about some of those? Those are great. <laughs> well, you know, I I, I do want to say this that you know coming coming out of coming out of uh, you know uh, Jewish families, all of what we're talking about is so out of the box. I mean, no. it's not, for example, in Judaism, you know, they're still waiting for Mashiach, the Messiah, but there's no concept of uh, God in human form. So all of these things, past lives and God in human form, and all of this is really more of the Eastern influence, the Eastern understandings. And so when it started happening to us when we were young, we didn't have a context for it. Uh, like, like we didn't really know. So we had to uh, research and explore. But um, uh, I've had... I'll give you an answer of what kind of cultural difference it is. My mother, after I'd been involved with this Baba situation for about a year... She goes, what, what is this uh, Baba, Mr. Baba thing that you're into, you know? And I was like 19 years old. And I said, <laughs> and I said well, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, with Jesus. And she goes, she looks at me and goes, well, oh, we don't believe in Jesus, you know? And I'm like, there goes that conversation. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but I, I was lucky because my stepfather was very spiritual and he had a bookcase from the time I was... Yeah maybe in third grade 
and he had Krishnamurti and he had Yogananda and he had books on reincarnation, uh, Edgar Casey and all. And so I started reading them when I was young. So I did have, you know, I knew that other religions, other uh, re religions had the, these concepts, but, um, and we had, for example, the memory of being in the Sermon on the Mount separately when we didn't, I don't even think knew each other really. And um, mine um, came, came in a vision. Um, I wasn't sleeping, but I was um, in a deep relaxation state. And I had a vision of myself being a, uh, a young slave girl. And it was all, all the people were all, it was kind of like a picnic. Everybody was in family groups and they were having kind of like a picnic on this lawn and uh, away from this, uh, you know, on the mountain, on the, on a mount was um, Jesus, you know, giving the sermon, but I don't remember seeing him, but I remembered the smell and the feeling that I had and um, the smell of it. And it's very interesting because you, you say what, what <clears throat> makes, you know, recognizing um the the spiritual or the the god man or uh, the true guru which again judaism doesn't have that concept um a lot of times it's the smell there's a certain smell that is associated um and the first time that i went to india and i was involved in a duni and they throw sandalwood and rose petals and all into the into the fire and it was that smell that i had smelled and and it was that that that, that presence and that that feeling of love and when i so when i went there physically as soon as i the plane was coming into india and i could smell air india in 1971 <laughs> <laughs> and and the plane was coming down into the mumbai airport and they opened the door and all of the smells of the cow dung and the 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 incense and the sandalwood and rose petals and all of that all together, I just felt like I was home. And it was very, very powerful. Um, did, did you two know each other at the Sermon of the Mount times? Or you just were both there? No, because when we first got together, Jim was telling me his his dream or his experience. And I said, oh, my gosh, I had that as well. And, and, and it was that feeling kind of picnicking around and being around and then being in this presence. I think she was on the other side of the field. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the common connect that both of you were there. So, yeah, that was, was the connection in this life. I don't like the word smell. I like the word fragrance. Fragrance. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the feeling she described yeah, is very much the same feeling. It was. It was um, the the remembrance I had was that he had that, that Jesus had just left, mm -hmm. and um, the lingering fragrance and the atmosphere mm -hmm. was very light and and uh, what's the word. Um, well, the word Sahavas, you know, the present, the, being in the oh, presence of the, of the company master, of somebody, the company, yeah, uh, it was very much a celebrate celebratory atmosphere. It was very light, and uh, I like the word the word gay, very lighthearted and, and festive. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, atmosphere, along with the fragrance, yeah. Did you two have lives together that you remember? I'm sure that we've had many, you know, in the Vedas, it talks mm. about 84 lakh human lives, Don't right? Remember, and 51 crore incarnations. So I am sure that 8,400,000 lifetimes that we have had some together, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you guys too, though. I think we're, we all 
come together in family groups and incarnate many lifetimes. Yeah. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of cycle. Yeah. Because see, in the Hinduism, there's a, there's a very uh, uh, big difference between, let's say, Western uh, mythology and Indian or Hinduism mm -hmm. that uh, they say uh, you born and you dead. So this is journey from uh, birth to death, death. Rather, I say that. But in Hinduism, there's a cycle of uh, getting born again and again and going to die again and again and just taking... Uh, learning. I mean, it's a cycle of learning. Yeah. So the mistakes that you make in one life and then, you know, uh, you get a chance to correct them in the next one. <laughs> uh, we have so many jokes about, you know, uh, you know, having lives together as husband and wife. And so... Uh, be be fast. There is there is a fast, you know, where you uh, pray to get the same husband for you know seven lives. So, oh. <laughs> so so the jokes are about you know the husband and wives they are, which are fighting. They pray that you know may it be the seventh life. <laughs> I've got a great story regarding switching all this around in lifetimes. Uh, the first time I went to India was in 75 and I was staying in a place called Vilu Villa. Uh, and it was, it was in uh, Ahmedabad in the, in the Canton area of the, of the army base. And uh, we would have high tea every day at four o'clock, you know, we'd all get together, whoever was staying there, you know, wasn't that large, but you know, uh, and one of the pre people there, I was, I guess I was 21 and there was a guy there who was 29, who was a Sikh, who was an officer in the army. And we got to be friends and we'd talk and stuff, you know, and it was very funny because well, he taught me how to do a turban, you know, <laughs> <laughs> beside that, though, what was very funny was uh, this fellow, I can't remember his name. He was an absolute encyclopedic historian about what's called the Alamo in Texas in the U.S. that happened in the 19th century in the 1800s. It was a battle uh, where the Mexicans surrounded this this fort outside of Austin, Texas uh, called the Alamo and they ended, ended up getting beat. They got killed and all this. But this man knew everything about it. He knew who they were, all the different soldiers. I mean, absolutely just obsessed with it. He was there, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what was really funny was he would keep asking me about the Hindu religion as if I knew anything. You know? <laughs> and I knew more than he did. And I didn't know that much, you know, <laughs> just what I'd read through Baba in the you know few years I was involved. Um, so I found that to be just, a, you know, really a, a, a trick of fate in, in reincarnation, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rajni and Sandeep, do you have any past life memories or not? Not at all. We haven't experienced such thing. Uh, yeah. uh, living a very mundane life nowadays. <laughs> yes. as, as a youngster, I guess I mean I was I would say I was more spiritual, but uh, and uh, I guess you know I, well, I had uh, my, I mean out of both my parents, you know my mother was a spiritual one, so I lost her in 2017, and you know my father is a very very what shall I say agnostic person, so uh, I'm yeah. like more under his influence and. Uh, so I've been uh, reading, all of you may have heard about uh, Harari. You will know her, Harari and all. So uh, he, he's he's also a Jewish philosopher from Israel. So historian. Uh, historian, historian. So so I've been reading, you know, his books on world history and he talks about, you know, how religion was invented and all that. So uh, I mean, uh, that is the phase that I'm actually going through. So now that uh, I'm talking to both of you guys, I think... I can actually feel that maybe, you know, it's my call to, you know, come back into the fold of spirituality again, I guess. So, yes, I do believe in these calls, you know, uh, how universe, I mean, you can call it God, you can call it universe. Yes, that's him. So, <laughs> okay. So, so, but, but I, I, I mean, uh, today's, you know, conversation has been, uh, what shall I, spiritually very moving and uh, I can feel that pull towards you know uh, uh, Jim and Robin's invitation and you know 
we've been planning to uh, go to you know uh, Sai Baba's uh, place uh, for Shirdi, Shirdi. Shirdi. I mean, ah, yeah, we've been to Shirdi. Yeah. We've been to Shirdi. Yes. We've been to Shirdi. So, so you know, you know Mehdi Baba and Upasni Maharaj, the temple yeah. there, right outside of uh, Sai Baba's uh, tomb. There's a a little temple there. What is it? Maybe it's called. Maybe it's Kailash. I I forget. But that was where Upasni Maharaj and Mehir Baba, when he was Merwan, came. And Sai Baba passed Mehir Baba and bowed down to him and said, Paul Bardigar. So they, they know there at, at, uh, at uh, Sai Baba, if you go in and you talk with the, the head of the, the head guy that is uh, the head of their trust or something, there's an office there. He knows about Mehir Baba also. I, I might also mention that um, the Sai Baba, you know, Shirdi now, I mean, the whole place is very commercial and very crowded. Um, when we went, the last time we went, it was, it was, I mean, we got to, to go to a couple of places, but it was, it was Stand just, it, yeah, you know, it was just very, very commercial. But then we went down the road which is only about what an hour drive not even an hour well, drive to Yupazi Maharaj's in Sikori place in Sikori and it's much more in, uh, intimate there's mu there's not much going on there but the nuns that are there and the keepers there um, we got to walk around and be there and visit and and really just much more intimate kind of feeling uh, so that's just a thought and then of course all that is, well, it's a bit of a drive, you know, Nagar into Marizad and all that, but that's a whole nother, you know, for us, that's the jackpot, you know, <laughs> the Marizad, the Marabad, the, the Samadhi, the trust. Yeah, you know? but, the, but when, when they go to Shirdi, the, that, that's an interesting part is that um, it, with a spiritual practice, some people do develop cities where they can levitate and be in, translocate and be in different places at the same time. And um, so th those can be interesting and kind of seductive. But I think all the teachers say beware of the cities because they right. distract you. But it is interesting that Sai Bob would make Vibhuti where ashes would come and be manifested in the emeralds. And, you know, there, there's kind of a sparkling appeal to manifesting in such a obvious physical way i mean oh. uh, we, we are you know like you said that we are very skeptical as well as you know very uh, like uh, because see you are you are drawn towards all this uh, many times when you are going through a tough time and that is the time when you are most uh, susceptible and uh, you know most in danger of being, you know, caught in some kind of trap or anything. So one should be very, very, you know, you are uh, beware of such things. So you are looking for a spiritual guru. So it should be connected to your spirit and not to, you know, physical manifestations of, uh, I mean, precious things or uh, what shall I say? E even even uh, in something like uh, what you are saying, uh, rock, what is rock called? Ash, ash. Ash, even ashes, you know. I mean, spirit does not need to manifest itself in terms of, you know, physical things. So, uh, I mean, you are not a magician where you are trying to, you know, impress people by the tricks that you can perform. So, I, I think one should be wary of such things. Especially in India, yeah. You see. No, it's oh, yeah. everywhere, I think. It's everywhere, oh. I think. Well, unfortunately, the the people, you know, and 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 here's where the Western versus Eastern. I mean, you all know that very well, and and I've been going back and forth to India since seventy one, so that was is many years. And the last ten years before uh, COVID, I would li I lived there, you know, for m a lot of months at a time, back and forth. So I understand that. But in the West, they don't understand the difference between someone like Sacha Sai Baba and Sai Baba of Shirdi. I mean, they don't understand. They, they, as you say, it's um, um, uh, you know, the the um, the magician part of it 
is uh, draws people uh, without really understanding the difference. But I, Rajni, I totally agree with you. I mean, we both totally agree with you. You have to be very careful and, and skeptical is good. And then you go and you see what your heart tells you in terms of, you know, the true, I mean, you're looking for true spirituality. And so that concept of Sadhguru, of true Guru is also there, you know, in, in Hinduism that um, I, I'm very happy that you people have found. Uh, so that, that's very important that, you know, where we do believe in this calling thing that, you know, when you have to reach somewhere, then that place, that person, it calls you. So you finally, you know, you end up there. And if you are not going somewhere, that means that, you know, I mean, it's not part yeah. of your uh, calling or, uh, you know, destiny or uh, whatever you may like to call it. So in, the, in this yeah. lifetime. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, Rajni and Sandeep, could you address that question? Do you consider Shiva Shakti <clears throat> uh, you, everywhere you see Sarasvati, Lakshmi? Do you do you think of them as symbolic, or do you think of them as actual mm -hmm. uh, parts of divinity? I'm I'm trying to get at what are they really? See, uh, my understanding is that Hinduism is a, a kind of a, two, two stories, two uh, a God name. They try to explain some idea because see, uh, in Hinduism, uh, there are a lot of ideas and uh, people and books uh, tell you those ideas through some story, through some name, through some uh, God effect, you can say that. So uh, every every story has some metaphor. So they tell you something. Uh, either see, their number of God, as you mentioned, there I think uh, eighty-four thousand God or something like that. So you can pick and choose uh, any any type type of God and uh, you get to an idea to understand an idea. There's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a many stories. So uh, either you say uh, Shiva, Vishnu. Brahma, uh, all those uh, gods has some something to say, something to tell you. Shiva is called destroyer, uh, Vishnu is preserver, Brahma is the creator. So through those things, they they try to get you to the idea of what is how the how this uh, how the all all of this begins, how it's going to end. But this this is, keeps on like in. Uh, keeps on coming back. It's in comes in cycles. So every, you have so many, I think uh, you have so many lives in front of you. So those ideas are there. So I believe uh, these these th things helps you to understand things like what is good, what is bad, what is evil. Those things are there. Mm. Yeah. So uh, like you said, I mean, are they actual deities or uh, you know? Like Sandeep is saying, we, we believe that, you know, this is to make one understand. I mean, all of you must have heard or, uh, you know, read about the secret. You know, what, what it talks about, you know, I mean, having universe uh, as something uh, formless is difficult for people to visualize and, you know, to get connected to. You know, so connect in the form of Krishna or Shiva or, uh, you know, uh, Shakti or Lakshmi. So these are all probably <laughs> names manifestations for those ideas which would be very very easy for common people for 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 a layman to get connected to and to follow isn't it so we we believe that you know these are all part of uh, you may call it universe you may call it god you may call it a deity or you may call it just an idea but something uh, that would keep you on the right path i mean but probably the you know the 80% of indians who live in the village if, they are offering. Uh, I mean, if if you believe if you believe that there is nothing beyond this and that you know you may do good you may do bad nothing is going to happen to you then i guess it would be difficult to stick to a good life yeah that trump is a personification of that and his followers uh they froze. I think they're frozen. Yeah. <laughs> They'll unfreeze in a minute. <laughs> yeah. They're frozen in time. <laughs> uh oh. It, yeah. Maybe uh, they'll come back. Yeah. 
but okay. uh, but I think I think there, there we go. But I think you know it's interesting. Here here we are. You know, Eastern couple growing up in India, Western couple growing up in the U.S., and yet really bottom line the underpinnings of what we believe is really very much the same. Um, you know, that, that uh, the, 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 the idea of God's um, different forms of God, you know, there are different states of God and different qualities of God, of the universe, because in the universe, there is the, is that power that creates, <laughs> is that power that destroys, is that power you know that um where you're reborn and and manifests i mean the the uh uh energies of sexuality the en energies of finance finance or whatever you know th those are all qualities and all there and i think that what we you know we've been talking about really is very similar it, i think what di what's different is the is the outer uh, ritual, the 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 ceremony and the ritual, and and we for one are not big ones on on ritual. So we're we you know there there is really no ritual that we you know Meher Baba uh, talked about you know that the that the the um, that the old rituals they if you do them without any f love or feeling they're meaningless. Yes. So, yes. and what is what is really truly meaningful is is your love in your heart and your connection and how you live your life and how it manifests into daily life. How do these um, values manifest in daily life? To to me, oh. the bottom line of Hinduism and Buddhism is, and Christianity said it too. Jesus said, "As ye sow, so shall ye reap." The bottom line to me is cause and effect that we live in a causal universe we manifest what we put out and that the neat thing about hinduism and buddhism is you have lifetimes to evolve and perfect and and work through our our issues so we don't have to do it all in one lifetime and then be judged um uh, uh, once again, Gail, I would like to add to that, you know, why why that is uh, there is because, you know, we say that we live in a cause and effect universe, but it's not so easy to see. I mean, it doesn't happen. I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't happen instantly that, you know, you uh, you put some work somewhere, you know, at times the results may be delayed. At times the proportion of results that you got, some people get, you know, what shall I say? Uh, I mean, uh, lots of returns for what they've done some people don't get it so how do you justify that to the person who hasn't got it or who has who is probably in a bad place and uh, you know who is not having a good life then what do you tell that person that okay keep doing the good work it's accumulating you will get it if not in this lifetime then maybe in the next so i mean that gives a kind of spiritual solace that you know i have to uh, stick to the good paths uh maybe it's not showing now but, you know, that itself becomes a reward in itself that, you know, uh, that you are able to sleep peacefully at night because you are happy with the kind of life that you are living, isn't it? So if you are not doing wrong, even then if bad things, I mean, they happen, they happen to people. Even then if bad things are happening, then maybe it's probably some past karma that is visiting you now. So so it's, it's a highly evolved, I shall say, mechanism to, you know, make people some sense of their lives and you know what they're going through and come to terms with it um let's let's talk about how rajni and sandeep how you present these ideas to your children who are teenagers and how they as young people how do they evolve how do they use it how do they not use it how how did you get the message across and how did they react so I mean, it's not like, you know, it's nothing formal, nothing like we, you know, they sit with us and ask them, okay, what is God and what should we do? Yeah. I mean, it's just part of, uh, you know, the way one lives. So, uh, so, so, so it's like, you know, when we do uh, a puja and uh, so uh, we have this habit of, you know, tying a, uh, you know, this thread, uh, you know, red thread. And so 
it somehow so if there would be a special day then maybe you know maybe the children would ask that uh, you know we do the puja and tie it so otherwise also nowadays in india especially during this time due to political environment also already there a lot of lot of buzz and lot of uh, things happening in terms of uh, in uh, religious uh, sentiments already there is a the uh, high level of religion sentiment sentiments is moving in the in, in the country right now so they are already getting a lot of information from other from us from media from news from newspapers so so lot of lot of information they are getting outside our 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 area of knowledge yes there there is a move you know towards uh, fundamentalism i guess you know mm -hmm. i i think it's happening everywhere in the world but Uh, i mean we had a very very liberal education we would say that uh, you know but now uh, the movement is towards you know more show off more uh, you know uh, manifestation. more ma manifestation i mean uh, we were not overtly religious so to say but now is the time when people are trying to you know show there is a competition in terms of who is more religious or you know uh, I I don't know how to put it across. Well, I don't know if I'm making any sense. Modi so. Modi is kind of famous for Hindu nationalism, and that has yes. negative effects of like discrimination against Muslims. <clears throat> so it, it hasn't it hasn't been uh positive in many ways. Hindu nationalism. So the, so there is a kind of fragmentation, you know, but uh, in terms of so people. Uh, i would not say so much discrimination but people are becoming more and more conscious of their identity as you know hindus or muslims or sikhs or you Actually, know uh, hinduism is a concept of pluralism also see uh, in the hinduism hinduism never stops uh, see uh, when hinduism at at its peak we have we got buddhism we got jainism we got sikhism all emerges simultaneously in, in our world only so that way hinduism is very very uh, op yeah assimilative very open uh, we have no concept of conversion you know we have no concept of uh, uh, you know how other people should be brought into the fold of you know hinduism if you uh, connect with it you 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 come there you join it but as such you know there is no formal concept of how you can convert to become a hindu or things like that so uh, but but now things are changing in terms of that you know like i was saying that people are becoming very very conscious of uh, you know their religious identity which was yes. not the case earlier it was not the case earlier well where are your kids with this kind of spiritual thinking or identification as hindus so so they hear things from outside and then they come and then they tell us and they, you know so instead of we telling them uh, it it now becoming the other way around uh, hmm. so, so do they are they like sometimes kids don't want to do what their parents say and when they're teenagers so they like i don't want to do puja tonight but do they do they participate in in rituals and holidays uh in some some rituals are uh, i i must say is uh, very very important for us also like diwali uh, diwali puja is very important for us also we we feel that okay uh, this has to be done yeah there is no doubt about that so but on a on a daily basis now we are not doing it so yeah Okay. Like our parent, like our parents used to. So, um, but we do <laughs> less amount of those. Um, Jim and Robin, you've raised four boys. Uh, where are they? Do they identify with my or Baba's yeah. teachings, or where where are they? Uh, well, our oldest son, who's thirty eight now, uh, interestingly enough, first of all, uh, of the, the four. Uh, three of them, um, and I think actually the fourth also, there's underlying, wherever they're doing externally, there's one thing that always seems to be the uh, an underlying theme and that they have they all have good heart qualities. Uh, we've heard that from other folks too. And, and I think that no matter what their external theme they're going through at the moment, 
the heart quality is what has come through. Um, and I, I, that's, you know, despite us, um, you know, <laughs> I'm saying that jokingly. No, they, we, you know, they, they have this wonderful quality, all of them in their own way. Uh, and that I think to me is probably the most important part of it, whatever labels they use. Having said that, uh, our oldest son, Josh, is um, right now he's involved in his, this particular chapter of his life. Uh, he does this, you know, he goes back and forth. He's very involved um, in a very traditional form of Judaism um, where he's wearing the kip of the hat and he's wearing the prayer shawl underneath. See, see. And yeah. he's taking the kids and they go to temple all day on Saturday on Saturdays. And, and, you know, he's doing his own way of trying to be observant uh, in that way. And he's really interested in the history and, and he really embraces the whole cultural and traditional aspect. Um, you know, um, at this moment, that's, that's his route. He's done other routes with equal fervor <laughs> and enthusiasm. Um, and so the, of, of the four of them, he's got the most obvious, quote unquote, obvious, uh, I'll have to say religious, but it's coming from the heart. So that's a big difference also. That's something right. that you talk about as far as rites and rituals and all that. You know, if they don't do, if, if it's not done with the heart, then it's just rites and rituals. Uh, but with with this situation, it's it's coming from the heart. It's his way of showing devotion, and it is it, it is sincere. So he just happens to really identify with that kind of uh, track, that that method, you know. Okay, um, our second son, Jonathan. Uh, really, I don't see him involved in any kind of um, organized religious or you know spiritual organization of any sorts uh, but again he's a very very wonderful good-hearted loving person and he, that his life is that you know mm -hmm. uh, I can't speak for you know what he does individually moment by moment is he talking with God is he praying and all that stuff internally I don't know um, but you know what he what he shows is that quality. Uh, and our third son, I think, also has that quality, though he's a totally different person, you know, and, <clears throat> and really exhibits and his whole life is very different from from the others. But again, there's this, uh, we were just saw him last week. Uh, again, there's that quality that comes through. Uh, yeah. Um, so, all right, okay. go ahead. <laughs> For, well, uh, I, I, I wanted to say that, first of all, they, they all grew up with, you know, a certain amount of Judaism as far as, you know, major holidays and that kind of thing. And they also grew up in, in uh, Baba environment in the United States and Myrtle Beach and also in India. So all our kids have been to <laughs> India uh, more than one time. And Andrew, the one that he's talking about, our third son, when we went to the um, Alora Caves, Mm. And he 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 went. Uh, it was very interesting. He went into the Hindu temple there, and um, they um, you know they have the a big Shiva ligam and the you know the cow is there and all that and all these all these places where monks would stay that are built into the cave. The cave is carved into them into a mountain. Well, it's very, very beautiful and interesting. And he had a very significant spiritual experience there, which he won't talk about. But he said, Mom, I felt I feel like I've been here before and I know where things are. And he said, I'm afraid, you know, to tell you and all this. And, uh, you know, we're very open with our kids so they can tell us anything. <laughs> Um, but he, this was something that he kept to himself, but they do, they are not outward followers of, of any particular thing. But as Jim said, you know, the values are there, the, the value of family, the value of, of, uh, love 
for God and other human beings, the the love, uh, you know, being a good person, good words, good thoughts, good good deeds, you know, in life. So, um, Roshni and Sandeep, anything else that you would like people to know about Hinduism or your understanding of it that we haven't <clears throat> talked about? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, it's 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 a good way of life. I mean, we were born into it and um, we feel that had we not been born, like Jim and Robin have been drawn to it, uh, we would have also been kind of drawn to it also. I mean, uh, so that... Best part is that there's no pressure uh, in terms of also being Hindu, being Hindu, in fact. We, we seldom visit, uh, I think, temples, I think, uh, once in a month or so. So, it's kind of a very open environment. So, whatever you want to do with it, there's what? a lot of freedom it, it, it gives you. What about the influence of caste? I mean, that's something that hasn't translated to other countries. It's particularly Indian. And that, it still is a big influence in how you're thought of right yeah i mean that's 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 true and uh, you know i feel uh that you know that is one of the evils that has kind of crept in into uh, i mean uh uh we both are brahmins so we i mean it's easy for us to say that we don't believe in caste because we are not persecuted or we don't face discrimination because of that. But, uh, you know, we don't discriminate on that basis. And this is what we are we have taught our children also. So the new generations, I think, are, uh, you know, post-independence generations are much more open about it. Uh, much more, uh, what shall I say, uh, when, uh, the new children, they don't really identify themselves uh, through a caste and don't uh, try to bracket other people also because of the caste that they are uh, they are from. But uh, yes, it is still a, an evil and uh, might take a long time to you know eradicate. Yeah, but yeah. I think it should be. It should be. It must be. And uh, We are moving the right edge, but it, obviously it will take time. Hmm. You know, in marriage advertisements and online and in newspapers they still say you know this kind of cast of this kind of level from good job or from wherever so it it's still part of still the there. marriage it, it it is there but uh, you know it uh, nowadays i mean at least in the metropolitan cities uh, the marriage is also becoming quite metropolitan in terms of uh, that you know you would find uh, uh, you know, a Bengali Bahu or a Maharashtrian Bahu or, a, you know, uh, or an American Bahu, so to say. I mean, uh, so, uh, so the uh, children are very open-minded in terms of uh, that they don't uh, want to marry the same caste or same uh, religion anymore. That is, that is not, not uh, a criteria anymore. I mean, it's, it's the person that, that is more important than, you know, the caste that they belong to. But, you know, having said that, uh, when, we have had an arranged marriage and, you know, uh, when one is trying to arrange uh, one of the, this is one of the consideration in terms of, because you know that you would uh, find the same kind of environment. So there would be no adjustment. I mean, you have to adjust to the person, but, uh, you know, there would be no adjustment in terms of uh, the family environment, the values uh, uh, and the way of life, so to say. Right. So, I mean, right. like uh, He's, he's a tea toddler. I mean, it doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, and you know. So, uh, I mean, I come from a, that kind of a family also. So, you know, so these things make a difference. Had he been a different, uh, you know, would have taken some getting used to or you know getting adjusted to. We these are these are issues that uh, you know later turn into big ones. Uh, you know, uh, I see lots of youngsters fighting over you know these little things. Uh, which probably maybe were not an issue earlier. So that's why I would say that in arranged marriages, this is still one aspect. But uh, nowadays, uh, arranged marriage is not a very big thing anymore. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Even we would want our kids to marry for love, you know, to the person that they want to get married to and, you know, not look for our permission or our choice and, you know, wait for us to arrange it. So. 
But, you know, I, I've got to say again that 80% or so of Indians live in villages and their attitude as not highly educated people like you is going to be really different. Do you agree with that? They, I mean, they're not going to want their children to marry because of media, Because of especially uh, mobile phones. Now things are slowly, slowly uh, improving. But yes, India is a huge country. Uh, it's 1.3 billion people. And as you said, a lot of people lives in villages. So, See, as, a lot of years. As far as constitution is concerned, there is equality. I mean, the laws, as far as laws are concerned, there is equality. So, uh, I mean, reaching to the villages, See, uh, now it is more in terms of the economic viability of things. So, uh, I mean, you can't believe in caste and, you know, uh, be economically successful. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it had started uh, probably as a very good idea. It deteriorated into a very bad discriminatory thing. But I think we are on the right track now also. Okay. Thanks. Ro Jim and Robin, what uh, last thoughts about um, what you'd like people to know about Meyer Baba or your practice or whatever? Hmm. <laughs> I, you know, what comes to mind is, um, well, two things. One is when it, the final analysis, it really doesn't matter what's important is that, you know, you, you try to connect with that ultimate loving being that, you know, whoever you want to be. Um, but the other thing that just came to mind is I had a conversation with one of one of Baba's Mandali, one of the disciples, close ones, named Adi Kairani. And Adi one day said to me, he says, you know, um, it doesn't really matter who you follow, which which avatar you follow, which Christ you follow. However, <laughs> he goes, is it's kind of like if you're looking in a well with dirty water and picture the Christ from 5,000 years ago is a coin at the bottom of that well in dirty water. It's very hard to see it clearly and unadulterated. This is like Baba is following. He's the coin on top of the water. It hasn't sunk anywhere. It's very clear. It's very easy to follow, uh, much more pure that way. So in a sense, you know, though it doesn't matter really in the final analysis, whatever your connections are, you know, heart to heart, where you're coming from and what your past and, you know, how, how your orientation is at the moment. The important thing is that connection with God. Uh, and of course, having said that, I feel like I've got, you know, I'm hanging on to the daman, that skirt of the hem of the garment of the, of the latest, greatest version. <laughs> You know, much easier to follow it that way than trying to scrape through thousands of years of of, of um, distorted, hard to find literature that have been has been open to, you know, mundane interpretations. You know, so I guess. Yeah, and what I would like to say uh, too about it is that um, um, may her stress that in this incarnation in this cycle of time in the Kali Yuga that the that the mission is to speak universally in our hearts and have people uh, turn towards God instead of turning away from God which is what we see in our uh societies now every you know materialism is running rampant mm. as as gail as you were you know talking about before i don't want to get into politics or anything but you know we can all see the nationalism and the the selfishness and the the all of that um so meher baba said that the his mission in this cycle of time was to bring together all religions like beads on a string and and have not that they wouldn't lose their individuality if if one wants that, but but the underlying, the underpinning of the um, of the truth, of the knowledge and truth and love and and what the values are there. Um, and 
are are the same really it, that you if you if you live a life my message of love and truth let your life be my message of love and truth and when he said my i he wasn't referring to the small me you know the ego me he was referring to the god me the the so you could say let your life let my life be god's the expression of god's love and truth in the world and um the other thing um oh and i just forgot it now oh. what what kind of what would you recommend if someone was interested in learning about Meyer baba's teachings what books couple books would you recommend to get an overview um i we would just say that that there's a the website avatar meher m-e-h-e-r which means compassionate um baba meher baba m-e-h-e-r b-a-b-a -B -A, is compassionate father that's what it means dot com right or dot org uh, you know you could just google it yeah just <laughs> google it the, you know, the cosmology, the big one is God Speaks. The discourses are kind of the day-to-day -day, um, ideas. But, oh, I know what I was going to say. My, <laughs> I think that the, that the science that we have now that we're, that, that is coming into uh, the mainstream, more mainstream, is 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 the scientific evidence of all of this ancient knowledge so the ancient knowledge is there it's in the vedas it's in the um uh the bhagavad gita it's in uh all of the you know the torah it's there it's in uh the writings you know islam uh on yeah. it's all there all all the knowledge is there I don't think he came to establish anything new. It's all there. But he said, now it's time to live it. And the, the, the scientific, we are now able to see in quantum physics, for example, we're able to see what, you know, we use, they use in, the, in Vedic terms, you know, the, the aura and the chakras and everything, and the acupuncture, the meridians, all the energy systems, we can actually photograph all of those things and and they're there to be seen and we understand string theory and we understand the oneness behind the many i mean we it, it's there um and the the vibrations we're un, we're understanding about sound and light and vibration and the ohm point being you know the point of creation but it's a sound the ohm is also it's not, a, it's a sound, it's a vibration. So all of these things are in the, in the 22nd, in the 21st century, <laughs> um, not yet, dear. not yet. Uh, we're able to um, uh, see scientifically what the ancient traditions were, are actually teaching. And I think that's extremely significant. Gail, Gail. I want to add something to your question, the answer to your question regarding what kind of book, which books. Um, it really, you know, there's so much material that's out there already in so many different angles of how to approach it. Everything from pretty much historical, dry, to some other authors are, you know, are emotional based on experience. My honest answer is I would have to talk to the person a little further and find out what's what is it that's drawing them in a way, just kind of get a feel and then maybe explore, see what's available and say, well, that sounds like maybe this would be something you might like, you know, or maybe this would be. Some people are very intellectual in their approach at one moment. Some people shun that and are just really emotional. There's a mixture there. You know, there's something there for a lot of different approaches. So I'd want to feel a little more, I'd want to get a little more to get a feel for, you know, and then give them some options. And Hinduism acknowledges that there's karma yoga and bhakti yoga, jhana yoga. So they, they acknowledge there's different ways that people. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
Thank you so much, you four. I really appreciate it. I love having these kind of cross the world dialogue. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you.